Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Now, if there's one thing that we can take away from our research into maritime history, it's that every ship has a story. Some stories are timeless, thrilling epics that still shock us today, such as the Titanic or the Empress of Ireland, but other stories follow more humble trajectories. This is a story about two ships bound for the same destiny, with only happenstance and bad luck to blame for their inevitable downfall. This is the story of two unassuming cargo ships which became unintended casualties in the German plan to hunt down and destroy one of history's most famous ocean liners. It's the story of the Thistlegorm and the Rosalie Muller. In 1941, the world at large was embroiled in conflict. World War II was raging with full fury, and wartime efforts were at a fever pitch. Ships of all kinds were being called up for duty, donning drab camouflage colours while being laden down with all manner of equipment and armaments. Once cheerful passenger ships were converted to troop ships quickly and cargo vessels, and the sea became a battleground all of its own. During this time, the SS Thistlegorm was born. She was a British armed freighter built by Joseph Thompson and Sons Shipyard in Sunderland for the Alban Line, and she was launched in 1940. Thistlegorm was intended to transport all manner of cargo and was armed with anti aircraft guns and heavy caliber machine guns for defensive purposes. She was still a fairly new ship, having only undertaken three voyages to the US, Argentina, and then finally the West Indies, respectively, transporting cargo and troops to far off shores for use in the war effort. She was responsible for everything from aircraft parts to grain and rum. After these few voyages, she then moved on to Glasgow for repairs before setting out again. Yet, however, in the midst of her fourth voyage, Thistlegorm would ultimately become another casualty of the war. She was steaming for Alexandria from Glasgow in October of 1941 under the command of Captain William Ellis. Laden with cargo ranging from Morris commercial trucks, Universal Carrier armoured vehicles, Leyland and Albion lorries, Norton and BSA motorcycles, Bren guns, cases of ammunition, railway wagons, all of it to be used by the British Western Defence Force. And two LMS Stania class 8F steam locomotives were also on board. These were intended for use by the Egyptian National Railways. The ship was escorted by the light cruiser HMS Carlisle. She made her way towards her destination, taking a longer route around Africa to avoid a run-in with German U-boats and warplanes. However, the voyage ground to a halt when it was discovered that the Suez Canal had been blocked due to a collision between a tanker and a mine, ultimately resulting in the Thistlegorm anchoring at a spot known as Safe Anchorage F in the Red Sea, while the crew awaited the green light to proceed through the canal. Unfortunately, though, that green light would never come. The Thistlegorm remained at anchor for a full two weeks, essentially becoming a sitting duck. Captain Ellis and his crew were beginning to grow extremely impatient because their cargo was badly needed at its destination. On top of this, it was already October and the weather would soon be turning. At the same time, German intelligence had received word of a build-up of Allied troops in Egypt. And of deep interest to the Germans was a particularly important British transport vessel known to be travelling in the area, heavily laden with troops. Two Heinkel HE-111 bombers were dispatched to locate and destroy this troop ship. At anchor though, the crew of the Thistlegorm could hear a rumble in the distance, growing closer and closer as the aircraft approached. Looming high in the sky that night, the bombers circled like vultures, had a very limited amount of time to get the job done before they ran out of fuel and they had to turn around. And ultimately, the Germans were unable to locate their intended target, but this is extremely fortunate because the ship they were sent to destroy was actually the famous Cunard liner RMS Queen Mary. The Queen Mary was a valuable target for the Germans, as her capabilities as a liner meant that she was a fast and formidable force in the times of war. Roaring through the water at almost 30 knots, she was trouble enough to keep up with, that is, when and if she could even be spotted. Known as the Grey Ghost, she was capable of moving swiftly and quietly, carrying upwards of 16,000 troops, which was the largest number of soldiers ever transported by a single ship. Queen Mary's loss would be a painful one for Britain, and fortunately, she remained undetected by the two German warplanes on this particular night, but this would spell disaster for another vessel. Frustrated with their failure to locate Queen Mary and looking for a suitable target for their payload, after turning around, one of the pilots spotted a large vessel moored in the distance. 
After circling overhead once more, the pilots confirmed that the vessel was an enemy ship. She may not have been the elusive Queen Mary, but she was still a target. It was the SS Thistlegorm. The men on board Thistlegorm realized the sound of the airplane engines was suddenly beginning to grow louder and closer. The ship had virtually no other warning before the German aircraft dropped two bombs. And this triggered a catastrophic chain of events. The blast caused the ammunition within the holds to explode, turning night briefly into day, ripping the ship in two, and sending the two locomotives on board flying into the air before they came crashing back down and settled beneath the surface. Thistlegorm sank a mere 10 minutes later. HMS Carlisle, which had been escorting the ship, was able to successfully rescue almost everyone on board. However, four sailors and five Royal Navy gun crew members sadly perished in the sinking. The captain, William Ellis, was awarded the OBE for his valiant actions during the sinking. And crew member Angus McLee was also awarded both the George Medal and the Lloyds Medal for Bravery at Sea for the life-saving efforts he demonstrated that night. He recalls his actions on the night of the sinking, saying, I made for the side to jump overboard and the rail was almost red hot under my hand. I don't know why, but just as I was going to jump, I looked back and saw a gunner crawling along the deck on the other side. The deck was covered with broken glass and I had to take the bits out of my feet before I could carry the gunner through the flames, which came up to my chest in places. It was truly a moment of heroic bravery and selflessness in the face of a horrifying disaster. But events were about to take a dramatic turn because as she went up, Thistlegorm was so brightly lit, it lit up not only the night sky, but also the location of another ship nearby, the Rosalie Moller. She was also a British cargo ship, transporting coal throughout Britain, Europe, and even China. And on this particular voyage, she had been making her way towards Alexandria, just like Thistlegorm, laden with some 4,600 tons of coal. She had also been put on standby at a safe anchorage near the Thistlegorm, awaiting the clearance of the collision that was blocking travel through the Suez Canal, when her location was discovered via the bombing of the other ship. It took the Germans a mere 48 hours to return with two more bombs, this time meant to sink the Rosalie Mauler. The ship's captain, James Byrne, was a brash but seasoned Australian mariner with a penchant for running a tight ship with a pipe held between his teeth. Reportedly, he gazed up as the planes flew above his ship and raised a single fist in defiance as the bombs dropped and met their target around him, sinking the Rosalie Moller and claiming the lives of two men. Due to the close similarities in their sinkings, Thistlegorm and Rosalie Moller have become known as sister ships, even though they never actually shared a fleet. And so it was that two completely unrelated vessels became intertwined by the German hunt for the Queen Mary. Thistlegorm's wreck was largely considered lost for over a decade, until 1952, when famed maritime explorer and French naval officer Jacques Cousteau was led to the site of the wreck via information he'd received from a local fisherman. Upon discovering the whereabouts of Thistlegorm, it's rumoured that Cousteau even chopped off the top of the mast, which was visible above the surface, in order to prevent other divers and explorers from discovering and pillaging the wreck. Despite this apparent aversion to would-be salvaging missions, Cousteau himself did recover a few artefacts during his dive, which were chronicled in a 1956 edition of National Geographic magazine. While the discovery was an important one, it was largely lost to the sands of time after Cousteau's visit, as there was really no public interest in shipwrecks like that like there is today. Scuba diving as we know it in the modern day didn't really even exist yet, and as such, there was no proper means by which your average person would ever be able to explore the ocean's depths. It wouldn't be until the 1990s, when recreational diving had become popular in the Red Sea, when the wreck of the Thistlegorm would actually begin to gain some notoriety. The nearby city of Sharm El Sheikh was beginning to develop as a popular diving resort, and after a successful visit from the dive boat Apulster, the word of Thistlegorm began to spread amongst tourist divers and maritime enthusiasts alike, and she would quickly become a phenomenon. Today, the wreck site is revered for its large array of intact and historical artifacts, which take it from simply being the remains of an old, rusted cargo ship to an extremely popular underwater museum. Due to the fact that the blast responsible for the sinking had blown away much of her midship superstructure, the bulk of the ship itself is easily accessible to divers eager to explore this historic vessel. Those trained to make the dive are able to come face to face with all manner of World War II era vehicles and artifacts still resting within the ship's cargo holds, everything from army trucks, jeeps and motorcycles, to ammunition, wartime supplies, and yes, even those two locomotives, which still lie at the bottom, all enjoying visits from some 480 intrepid explorers every day. 
Marine life flourishes around Thistlegorm with schools of fish and a variety of coral, adding flashes of colour to the remains of the once proud wartime vessel and her cargo. Because Thistlegorm is such a prominent diving venture, the wreck itself has sadly sustained damage over the years, which is unfortunately accelerating the pace of her decay. These days we're very conscious of what a mixture of sea currents, diving, salvage and marine life can do to shipwrecks resting beneath the surface. The wreck of the Titanic is a notable example of this kind of research and decline. There are now protections in place to help preserve Thistlegorm's wreck site for future generations, thanks to efforts by entities such as UNESCO. However, these efforts only reach so far and it's been reported that many items continue to be looted from the site, such as the ship's bell, and even an entire motorcycle. Frequent diving continues to damage the structure as well, with some recent reports stating that the ship's anchor chain has been broken and fallen away from the ship. Technology, however, has afforded us a means to experience Thistlegorm without danger of compromising the wreck itself. The Thistlegorm project aims to both protect the ship's legacy and bring awareness to the wonders of the wreck itself, offering a full 3D model comprising almost 25,000 high-resolution images of the wreck, which required thousands of hours of computing time and manual labour to properly process. It was undoubtedly a monumental undertaking on the part of the team, and we absolutely encourage you to take a few moments to check out the project and support their work. It's because of the hard work and dedication of teams like those of the Thistlegorm project that we're able to properly study and appreciate maritime history as we do today. To quote Jacques Cousteau, the explorer who actually originally found the wreck, for most of history man has had to fight nature to survive, and this century he's beginning to realise that in order to survive, he must protect it. Similarly to Thistlegorm, Rosalie Moller would have to wait quite some time after her sinking before she would be interacted with by humans again. There's some debate surrounding exactly when she was found and by whom. After the conclusion of World War II, the need arose for raw materials for use in manufacturing, and one method of meeting this need was by salvaging the cargo of sunken ships. It was reported that the Rosalie Moller was among the ships having been discovered and salvaged during this time. However, the only physical record of this would be a missing portion of her propeller, which had been apparently cleanly cut off. Many experts claim that it was not until the early 1990s when the ship was actually successfully dived for the first time. Regardless of the details surrounding her discovery, the Rosalie Moller has, much like her spiritual sister ship, become a well-loved destination for divers looking to explore part of maritime history. While Thistlegorm is now known to have sustained serious damage due to sea currents and human interaction, Rosalie Moller on the other hand remains in overall decent shape due to currents being much gentler in the area where she now rests. She's also been spared much of the effects of overdiving for two important reasons. First, Rosalie Moller was not actually carrying unique cargo like Thistlegorm, just coal, and lots of it. Overall though, many simply consider motorcycles and trains to be a much more interesting dive subject, but secondly, and possibly more importantly, diving to the side of Rosalie Moller requires much more extensive training and skill than diving the Thistlegorm. Divers are encouraged to have more advanced certification before they can take the trip to the wreck, and as a result, very few people have the training necessary to even reach the wreck to begin with. All of this taken together means that while Rosalie Moller may not be the more famous of the two shipwrecks, she's arguably the more intact. She sits upright on the sea floor, her bow still standing tall and proud, and full loads of coal remain in her cargo holds and can be accessed by divers. Pots and pans still even hang in the galley, and the mast and rudder are both still intact. A staircase still stands, leading up to her brass whistle, which still remains in good condition. The hole left by the bomb which destroyed the ship is also visible on her port side, a sad reminder of her violent end. There are a few reports of pillaging, most notably up in the bridge, which has been stripped of its compass binnacle, telegraphs, and bell. The captain's safe also lays on the floor, looking as though it was apparently forced open. It seems as though the idea of taking home a historical souvenir may just be too tempting for certain divers, even at the expense of the conservation of the very history that it represents. The SS Thistlegorm and the Rosalie Moller, two ships caught in the crossfires of war under shockingly similar circumstances, now serve as war monuments and fascinating time capsules. They were both lost to the same German bombers a mere 48 hours apart, while waiting near the same anchorage point on their way to the same destination. To visit either of these ships is to do more than just dive a shipwreck. It's taking a step back in time to come face to face with the harsh realities of an inescapable war. It's marvelling at the out of place and bizarre, such as the motorcycles and trains resting beneath the waves, and perhaps most importantly, it's taking the opportunity to appreciate history for what it is, the complex interwoven stories of the past enriching our experiences of the present. But if you're thinking of visiting, 
for the sake of the ships and future generations, please dive responsibly. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.